National Five Historians and welcome to our next lesson in our Hitler and Nazi Germany topic. In this lesson we are thinking about how Hitler used this popularity that we were talking about in the previous lessons and used this momentum to enable him to become Chancellor of Germany. Your learning intention for this lesson is to explain why Hitler was asked to become Chancellor in 1933 and to think about the events that led up to this. So put a note of the title somewhere in your, your notes or in your jotter and continue the lesson. So just as a quick recap, thinking about the last lesson and what we talked about regarding things like the Wall Street crash, we're thinking about how this actually gave a lot of power to Hitler's rise um, to power at this point in time and what kind of role it played. So as we know, the political parties were divided on how best to kind of handle the depression that followed in Germany and they tended to be more coalition governments. So they ultimately didn't actually seem to be doing an awful lot, whereas the Hitler and the Nazi party, on the other hand, were opening soup kitchens and were doing more. The crash obviously ended the relative stability they had been experiencing during the golden years. So people were sort of doubly bitter because they felt like they were already quite bad after hyperinflation had set in and then they had recovered some and they were feeling a lot better about things but ultimately it just then went completely wrong again and the government again didn't seem to have a good handle on how to deal with it or how to prevent it. Hitler on the other hand he's promising bread, jobs and homes to these starving, unemployed and homeless people so he's kind of promising all of these easy solutions to the difficult problems they're facing. The Weimar government, on the other hand, introduced unpopular policies, things like raising taxes, cutting wages and reducing unemployment benefit in a group of people that were already quite living in quite a lot of difficulty. So that was obviously not a good situation to be in either. Hitler pretty much gave hope and offered strong leadership and stability and greater prosperity to the people. So it is no wonder that the Nazi party did quite quickly become the most popular party in the Reichstag at this point in time. Obviously when we think about did Hitler come to power just because of the Great Depression, the answer to that is actually no. The Great Depression was, as AGP Taylor said, the thing that put the wind in Hitler's sails. It just gave him more opportunity to kind of show that the Nazi party could be a better option um, than the Weimar Republic had been. But another reason for the growth of the Nazi party is that important people actually supported them with money and with a lot of publicity because they thought that the Nazi party would be useful towards them. Now these are, we're talking about the big business people who really thought that this would actually benefit them, the ones that were frightened of communism. One of these was quite a famous politician, Alfred Hugenberg, who we can see down here. He was one of these people that did put a lot of money into Hitler and the Nazi party's kind of way forward and into the propaganda pieces that they were using. Hitler was famous for quoting this, millions stand behind me, and what he kind of meant with this was not just the millions of people that the support they had gathered during the Great Depression era had given them, but also a lot of these, these millions of money. Hugenberg on one side saw the Nazi party as a strong group that would stop communism. He also thought that he could use Hitler to get publicity for his own nationalistic political beliefs. And as a result, he poured money into the huge publicity campaign that was developed to promote the Nazis. He owned most of Germany's new cinema industry and hundreds of local newspapers. So he could quite easily arrange for Hitler to be on the front page news across Germany and on every single newsreel at the cinema. Now this was the only place that people could actually see the news at this point in time. A lot of them went two or three times a week, which meant that they were being exposed to the Nazi message quite often and quite frequently. And that was obviously important towards getting more and more people involved in this. This media publicity gives the Nazi party the thing that they had been lacking, which was a national profile across Germany. Though Hitler had gained the same sort of profile using his trial and the failed Munich Putsch, the party itself didn't quite have it yet. Other businessmen, impressed by the images of the Nazis in the cinema and in the news through Hugenberg, then also invested and gave lots of money to the party to try and use any way they saw fit. So the Nazis then were able to operate legitimate political party campaigns in order to actually get power. So these are the people that kind of finance them. 
So we've got a lot of these groups of people. So we've got people who were the head of the Reichsbank who organised funding parties. We've got a German steel businessman. We've got steel firm owner, coal businessman, chemical firms, things like that. All of these people greatly benefited from actually having some sort of financial say in what was going on with the Nazi party over what was going on with the Weimar Republic. So it's maybe a good option for this to kind of think about who these people are um, and what you should do is just kind of summarise this part of the slide. So the Nazis operated as a legitimate political party, so who financed their election campaigns and we're just going to have many industrialist bankrolled Nazis, including allegedly, and then you could pick one or two of them that we could write down. I'm going to highlight all of them, but you don't need to write all of them. You can if you like, but you only need to pick one or two that you're going to use as your example. So pick the two that stand out most to you, the two you think you're going to remember the most, and you could write these down. You could also include um, Hugenberg as well from the previous slides. OK, so you've got these people. The important one might be that one at the bottom. We've also got foreign firms, which include Henry Ford. Uh, we've got the Union Banking Corporation in New York. And we've got some other people there as well. So copy that first bit in the blue box and then pick a couple of examples from each of the lists first sentence and then a couple of examples and then second sentence and a couple of examples from that. So Hitler often claimed millions stand behind me. Now one meaning of this is the millions of people who supported the Nazis but those against the party also claimed it meant these millions of marks or the money that the businessmen put in. So we're just going to add that as a quick note underneath our examples from the previous slide. OK, just so you can kind of tie those two things in together. So how important was the Reichstag at this point in time towards Hitler becoming Chancellor? So the Reichstag was the symbol of Weimar Germany. It reminded people of the freedoms and government that they had been given by the Weimar Constitution, Hitler hated both of them, the Reichstag and the Weimar Constitution. He was against democracy because he felt that it made Germany weak, but after the failed putsch, he knew in order to gain power, he would have to make the Nazi party the biggest in the Reichstag, and in other words, he'd have to do it legally. We don't have to write this down because it's just a recap of what we've already talked about. So between 1930 and 1932, Germany was ruled by a minority in the Reichstag. The parties couldn't agree on how to deal with Germany's problems and many people lost faith in democracy and discontent grew. So we are going to write this slide down, just these bullet points. So many people couldn't agree on how to deal with Germany's problems. People lost faith in democracy and discontent grew. OK, so that means the time is right for the Nazis to try and take over. In November 1932, when unemployment was still very high, a general election was held and the Nazi party became the largest single party in the Reichstag. However, they still did not have an overall majority at this point in time. If the other parties joined together, they would still be outvoted. So this meant that they could still be blocked if they were trying to get a government formed. Okay, and a lot of bullet points there. So Hitler knew in order to try and ensure that his party would actually be listened to the way that he wanted it, he would have to be in a position of authority. The thing he wanted most was the chancellorship. Now there were three main politicians within the Weimar government in Germany who helped with this rise to power of Hitler. The first was this man here, President Hindenburg. He was a national hero, but by 1932 he was an older man, um, not always very clear in his thinking. He had periods where he was a bit confused and he did not like Hitler. He believed that Hitler was 
single-handedly one of the biggest threats that had appeared in Germany over the course of the Weimar government. The second one is this guy, Franz von Papen, who did actually become Chancellor for a short time and he hoped that he could use Hitler for his own political advantage, but obviously that backfired quite spectacularly for him. The third one was General von Schleiser. He was quite an ambitious army general, he wanted to become Chancellor and he knew he needed Hitler on side to get support from the public. And again, he thought he could use Hitler for his own devices. So, you might want to kind of make a note of the Weimar government structure to kind of explain how this actually helped and enabled Hitler to get the position of Chancellor. So we know that we have the president, the people vote for a president and they do this every so many years and his job is to appoint someone from the Reichstag to control the running of Germany. This person usually comes from the biggest party or someone that he knows others will get along with. Once he's appointed this person, they then take over running the country, making the laws and they take these laws to the Reichstag to be approved by vote before they are passed. He then appoints eight others called the cabinet from these parties to help him. And they become the ones in charge at this point in time. In the Weimar government, we have obviously got President Hindenburg, who we now know. He then also has to appoint his chancellor. The Reichstag is made up for from people of different parties that have been voted by the people of Germany, so it's got lots of different parties and none of them have any sort of majority at this point in time. You have the Nazi party on one side, you have the centre party, at the same time you've got some of the more moderate centre party groups you have the KPD, who are more of the communist groups, and then you have the SPD on the other side as well. If we think about this, who is he going to pick to be his chancellor and from which party is he going to pick them? Now, if he was going for the largest party, he would be picking someone from the Nazi party. If he was going with someone he thought would get along well with other ones, he could pick someone from the centre party or something similar from that. So what happened with this then? Chancellor Burring, who was Chancellor for a very long time, resigned in May 1932 because of his inability to win support for his policies and he was replaced by von Papen, who was from the Centre Party. That was the fourth biggest party in the Reichstag. Von Papen immediately asked for emergency rule from Hindenburg, which, remember, the Weimar Constitution allows, and von Papen was so convinced that he could control Hitler and was confident of winning the Nazi support that he had said, in six months, we will have pushed him so far into a corner that Hitler will be squealing. Now, he was very wrong with this. That was not what happened whatsoever. He only had six to eight supporters in the Reichstag when he was appointed. He hoped to win more support in the 1932 election, but he was sorely disappointed by that. The Nazi party won 230 seats out of 608. Hitler wanted to be appointed chancellor, rightly so, because his party was the biggest. Hindenburg supported von Papen. The Reichstag decided to hold a vote to decide whether or not they would also support von Papen as chancellor, and he won 32 votes, but 513 had voted against him. In March 1932 then, Hitler stood against Hindenburg as president of Germany and managed to gain 13.4 million votes, but Hindenburg won with 19.3 million. Von Papen organised another election in November and the support for him in this election was actually even less and he was forced to resign the chancellorship. So what I want you to do with this slide is just put the heading how politicians helped Hitler become Chancellor, von Papen, and I just want you to summarise this slide into no more than two or three sentences in your own words about how he actually did help towards this. So you might have said, for example, just by reading this, that he didn't have a lot of support in the Reichstag and 
when he tried to gain support, he only won a certain number of votes and it wasn't enough and therefore he had to resign. Something like that. The next politician that we're looking at is von Schleiser. So when von Papen resigned, he was appointed as chancellor in his place. And he also hoped that he would be able to control Hitler. But he quite sorely misjudged the Nazi party. He basically tried to prevent the same mistake that von Papen had seen happening by limiting the activities of the Nazi party and keeping them, as he said, under his thumb. And in retaliation for this, Hitler reacted. And instead, he held a meeting with von Papen and joined with him to remove von Schleiser from power. Now, if you remember back to Rise of Evil, that was kind of what happened. They had this meeting where Hitler made out that von Schleiser had done this on purpose to von Papen and that Hitler and von Papen could get their own back. The plan was to convince Hindenburg that Hitler was the only choice of Chancellor and that with von Papen as Vice-Chancellor, the Nazi party could then be controlled. So again, same thing, put von, von Schleiser's name, you're going to just summarise what's been done with him, why he's important, into two or three sentences, and then move on to the next slide. So basically, this gives us kind of an overview, okay, why he was made Chancellor. So von Schleiser hated him, but Hitler could be useful to them. Von Papen thought the same. Hitler knew he would be needed because his party was the biggest and was causing trouble, so he could wait. Hindenburg doesn't like him. Maybe he could make him vice-chancellor instead. And that's the position he was offered, the second in command of the, of the chancellor, the second in command there and the third highest seat of authority within Germany. The thought being that this could sort of placate the Nazis enough that they would then stand down from what they were doing and that the Weimar Republic and the Reichstag could actually move forward to try and sort things in Germany. However, Hitler said no and in the end Hindenburg had no choice. Both von Papen and von Schleiser had failed to build a government that would actually agree and do things that they were needed. Meanwhile, the Nazi party are manipulating the Reichstag, they're making Germany completely ungovernable, they're walking out, as we saw in Rise of Evil. They are the biggest political party, so it was easy for Hitler to order them to walk out at a moment's notice, which then would force another Reichstag election, which they then campaigned for, got more seats and became bigger and bigger. Again, like we said, Hitler was offered vice-chancellor if he would get this to stop, but he refused claiming his party deserved, his party's popularity meant he deserved much more than third place. So Hindenburg does not like Hitler, but knew that the Nazi party would destroy the shreds of democracy that were left if he did not act. So he had no other option. So we're going to write this down for Hindenburg. He appointed Hitler as Chancellor as the only option left to him on the 30th of January 1933. And you can see the picture there of Hitler being sworn in by Hindenburg as Chancellor. Now this picture was taken soon after that swearing in. Have a think about what you can actually see happening in this picture. Look at Hindenburg, look at how he looks, how happy he might look compared to Hitler sitting beside him. Look in the, kind of the background, it's a bit fuzzy, but there's lots of people out to celebrate for this and things that we're really quite happy with. This picture as well, referred to as the temporary triangle. What do you kind of notice about this picture? Have a think about it. We've got von Hindenburg and von Papen together. They're singing a song. It's the For He's a Jolly Good Fellow song. So it sounds like they have given him their support and that's how he's kind of been risen above them almost, despite the fact that one's supposed to be the president and the other one the vice chancellor with Hitler as chancellor. Immediately after gaining power, Hitler asked for another general election. He argued that he wanted to win more support and rule in a democratic way. Okay, so we're just gonna write this slide down as well. 
Elections were arranged from March 1933 and weeks before the elections took place, the campaigns became more and more violent. People were beaten in the streets, the communists were attacked, some of them were arrested. It just became really chaotic at this point in time. Huge marches, flag waving, huge rallies that brought lots and lots of support. Nazi party people threatening those that were against them, openly fighting communists in the streets. Hitler really wanted people to think that only he would be able to get rid of the communist threat in Germany once and for all. And it seemed like they were kind of pushing towards this idea of the Nazis being the saviours of Germany, but they needed something that would rally the people around. Luckily, one week before the elections, disaster struck. So for this one, you're just kind of going to continue your last note and just add what they kind of were doing um, to try and win the support for the communists in the street and this kind of point there as well. And I know there's quite a bit there. but So one week before the elections, the disaster totally struck. And we'll come back to this disaster in the next lesson. So how did Hitler actually become Chancellor? So quick task for you to do here. What I want you to do is arrange the dates in chronological order in your jotter. You can either print it out if you want to um, from the PowerPoint or you can write them out. And I want you to highlight in one colour the date Hitler became Chancellor. After you've done that, the questions that are in the boxes above, I want you just to answer in your jotter underneath you, your table as you've put it in the right order. It doesn't have to be done as inquiry skills questions, they're just general questions for you to answer in your notes. So pause the video roughly about 22 and say 8 seconds and complete these tasks and then come back to the video. Okay, so another task then for you here. You should use the worksheet, How Hitler Became Chancellor. You will see that in the team or it'll be in files and you'll see that there's a little table that I'll show you a picture of it in a second. What you want to do with the table is read the information about the phrases that explain how these things helped Hitler come to power. And you're going to link the keywords that we have on this slide here with the phrases so that we can create our anagram that helps us remember how Hitler ultimately became Chancellor. Now, the anagram we use is limp paper. So we've got a mix of this in order. We've got the long term bitterness for our L. We've got our ineffective constitution for our I. We've got money for our M. We've got propaganda or personal qualities or program for our P's. We've got attacks on other parties for our A. We've got economic depression for our E. And lastly, we've got recruited by Hindenburg finally as our R. So when you put this information into your worksheet, it should then spell this anagram down the side with all of your information for each one. If you're asked an explain question or a describe question on this, this is the anagram you would come back to to remind yourself of the reasons why Hitler ultimately came to power. So ineffective constitutions, propaganda, attacks on other parties, economic depression, money, recruited by Hindenburg, the programme they were offering, long-term bitterness and the personal qualities of Hitler and the Nazis, which spells limp paper for our anagram to help remember it. This is the worksheet here. I filled in the first one for you, so long-term bitterness is there, and then you should be spelling the anagram down the side as you go. So these ones are our long-term ones, the ones that are present from the 1920s up at the top here, and then these ones are our two short-term ones down at the bottom. So complete that worksheet, stick it into your jotter. Please don't write all of this out because it will take a long time, so either print it or do it in the Word document and take a photo of it for your notes, whatever you want to do, but please don't sit and write the whole thing out because it will take a long time to do that. Okay, so your assignment task for this week then is to use your notes and information that you've just got using the worksheet to help you to answer this explain question 
and upload your answer into the assignment tab. Any questions that you've got or anything that doesn't make sense, feel free to ask your teacher, email, put a message into the team and let us know how you're getting on.